Okay, everyone, we are now going to take a look at chapter six, which continues our discussion about the time value of money. Specifically, we're going to determine the future and present value of an investment with multiple cash flows. In chapter five, we looked at what's the value of some one future amount if we invest a certain amount today or vice versa. What would we have to invest today to get to a one certain future amount? Where now this is going to look at more than one investment over time and determining its future and or present value. We're gonna look at loan payments, how they're calculated. So how did they know how much to charge you each month for a loan? We're gonna look at that. How are loans what we call amortized or paid off? And then show how interest rates are quoted and misquoted. So specifically future and present values of multiple cash flows will be looked at. Something called annuities and perpetuities comparing rates, different interest rates, loan types, and loan amortization. So here's our first example. So we already know how to calculate present value and future value of one amount. But you think you will be able to deposit $4,000 at the end of each of the next three years in a bank account that will pay 8% interest. So now you're not making one interest payment, or I'm sorry, one deposit of $4,000 today, okay? Now you're saying I can make $4,000 at the end of each year for the next three years. You currently have $7,000 in the account. How much will you have in three years? How much will you have in four years. So now it's a little bit more complex. Today, time zero, you have $7,000. You want to know how much just that amount will be worth at the end of three years given an 8% interest rate. So you're calculating the future value of that $7,000 payment. Now you could go back to chapter five and use your formulas, or you could use your finance calculator. Whichever way, what you're calculating is the future value. So I'm going into my calculator, and in the finance function, I'm putting N is three, I is eight. Present value, I'm putting in, they tell you to put it in as a minus 7,000, and I'm gonna arrow down and alpha, enter, to get $8,817.98. The next step is, now you're going to make a $4,000 payment at the end of year one. How much will that be worth at the end of year three? So now your periods are two periods. End of year one, Want to know what it's worth at the end of year three. So three minus one is two. So the future value of that deposit will be N is two, I is eight. Put your, um, it would be considered present value, 4,000, although it isn't actually present value for purposes of this computation, it would be. Alpha, enter for your future value, you get 4,665.60. Do the same thing with the payment that is made at the end of year two. So it's only gonna compound for one period. I is 8%, putting 4,000 in. Alpha, enter, it'll be worth $4,320. And the amount you put in at the end of year three will be worth $4,000 at the end of year three. So that's already in its future value. 
So now you add up each separate future value computation, 88, 17, 98, what the original 7,000 will be worth at the end of three years, plus the 4,665.60, the first $4,000 deposit at the end of year one, plus the future value of the second $4,000 deposit, plus the future value, which is also the value when it's deposited because end of year three is when you're making that deposit. So those separate deposits, the future values are calculated for each one separately, add them up, they will total 21,803.58. Now, the second question said is, well, what would they be worth at the end of year four? We'll take the value of them at the end of year three, that is now considered your present value, 21,803, and we want to know what that will be worth at the end of year four, one period for now. So I'm going into my apps, my finance, my time value of money solver, my N is one, my eight, my I is 8%. My present value will now be negative 21,803.58. And then I'll solve for the future value, and it comes out to be 23,547.86. Now, another way you could have done this, since you're just trying to figure out how much would that total amount be at the end of the next year, take the current value of 21,803.58 times 1.08, because you just want to know one interest cycle there. So it will definitely be worth 100% it is now, but it'll increase by 8% because of the interest rate. So it's 1.08 to the one power. 23,547.86 or 87, 87. Okay, so you get the same answer either way. But when you have multiple cash flows, especially when they're different and happening at different times, um, we need to calculate them separately. Suppose you invest $500 in a mutual fund today and 600 in one year. If the fund pays 9% annually, how much will you have in two years? Again, as of today, year time zero, that the $500 you put away today will sit there for two years, an entire two years. So you wanna calculate the future value, N is two, I is 9%. So you could use your formula, which you already know how to do. I'm using my calculator. N is two, I is nine, present value, so the amount you're putting away today, $500. I'm putting that in as a negative, and then I'm gonna alpha enter for my future value. The value of that deposit is 594.05. The deposit I make at the beginning of year two, or end of year one, end of year one, and I need to know its value if it compounds for one period, I is nine, the amount is negative 600, so that'll be the present value. Alpha enter, $654 for my future value. So those two amounts added together will give me what that is worth at the end of two years, those two different deposits. So remember, the first deposit will be compounding over a two-year period. One year it'll compound, then the second year. The year one deposit will only earn interest on it for one year. How much will you have in five years if you make no further deposits? Okay, so there's two ways of doing this. Let's say we just knew you're gonna get, give 500 in year at point zero. So it's going to sit there for the entire five years and then you're gonna make one deposit at the end of year one. So it will be sitting there earning interest for four periods. Well, we wanna know the future value. So I'm gonna go, um, when N is five, I is 9% and I put away 500, negative 500. Calculate the future value, alpha enter, 769.31. Now I'm gonna do the same thing 
for my second deposit that will be compounding over the next four periods. I is nine, I'm gonna put the um, present value, that's the day you're depositing it, is negative 600. Arrow down, alpha enter, $846.95. Now, what if instead, so add those two together, that's your total amount. But what if instead we already knew the 1248.05? That's what it's worth at the end of three periods. I'm sorry, at the end of year two, end of year two. Well, what they're saying here is, well, if you already know that, you can go and put your N, you need to compound it for three more periods. So at the end of year two, it has a value of 1248.05. Compound that entire 1248.05, since there's no more deposits for three periods, 9%, make the 1248.05 your present value amount in your calculator or even in your computation, arrow down, and alpha enter to solve. So either way, it will give you the same answer. What if you plan to deposit $100 into an account in one year and $300 into the account in three years? How much will be in the account in five years? So what I encourage you to do is draw a timeline. Um, I am not able to on my computer, but I'll tell you what to do with it. Let me find a blank piece of paper. Oh, sorry. Now, that's not what I want to use. Where's a blank piece of paper when you need one, right? So what you're going to do is draw a timeline. Now, at some point it's time zero, right? So then we'll have the end of year one will be our first um, vertical line after time zero. Then our next vertical line is two, three, four, and five. So you should have one, two, three, four, five, six vertical lines on your horizontal timeline. The first one being zero and then numbering them out. Normally, we make a deposit at time zero, but that's not what's happening here. It's saying you plan to deposit 100 into an account in one year. So it's really the beginning of year two or end of year one. So I'm gonna put $100 either above or below my end of year one vertical um, item, and a uh, vertical line on my timeline, I should say, and $300 in the account in three years. So that's the end of year three. Okay, so that I know when am I depositing this? If I was depositing it today, it would be compounding over five years, but it's not. That first uh, payment is going in in one year. So it's only going to compound for four periods. So you got to be careful of that. So we want to know what's the future value of that $100 if the periods it compounds are four years at 8% interest. So N is four, or if you're using your formulas, you would use four for your N. Interest is 8%. Present value would be negative 100 because that's your deposit you're making and you're determining its future value. Alpha enter for future value 136.05. So that's the future value of the 100. Now, how about the $300 deposit? Well, that's being deposited at the end of year three. So it's only going to compound for two more years. So N is two and you're going to use 8%. So you wanna change your N to two and change your present value the day the amount you're investing at the end of year three to 300. Then you're gonna use your arrow key down and alpha enter 
to solve 349,992. So you're going to add those two together and that will be the future value of those two future payments. So we gotta be careful and drawing a timeline will help us see, okay, I'm not investing this at time zero. If I was, your N would be five, right? Because it would be compounding each year for five years. But because of the timing of the deposit, the compounding periods will vary. This was from example 6.3. It's just another, oh, find the present value of each cash flow and add them. Let's see this one, it's in the book. I think example 6.3, chapter five. So now we're switching gears. Now they're saying, instead of finding the future value of these payments, Tell me what the present value of each of these future amounts are. Example 6.3, and this is on page 154 of your book. So it says, how much is it worth? You are offered an investment that will pay you $200 in one year, $400 the next year, 600 the next year, and 800 at the end of the fourth year. Assume there's a 12% interest rate. What is the most you should pay for this investment? So it's saying, pay us today. You're gonna to get $200 at the end of year one, 400 at the end of year two, 600 at the end of year three, and 800 at the end of year four. How much should you be willing to pay assuming there's a 12% interest rate? Well, now if you think about this, you're buying it today at time zero. Draw yourself a timeline. Again, and then draw five vertical lines to represent the periods on your timeline. So you have zero, end of year one, end of year two, end of year three, and end of year four. So again, at the end of year one, you're gonna get 200. End of year two, 300 or 400 end of year three, 600, and end of year four, 800. So those are the future amounts. So what we need to do is determine how much are they worth today? What should you pay to have the right to receive those amounts? So now you're calculating, again, present value. Now you could use your formulas. I'm just going to use my calculator. The key here is the N. So the $200 payment is only one period because the first payment, the future value is at the end of year one. The $400 amount you'll get in the future is in two periods, so your N is two. The $600 for calculating present value, N is three. And then the $800 future amount you're gonna get at the end of year four, you would calculate present value by using N is four. I is 12%. Now, if you're using your financial calculator, for the first computation, you're gonna say N is one, I is 12. You're gonna be calculating for present value, so you wanna put future value in. So I'm gonna put 200 in my future value, arrow back up to present value, and alpha enter. And the present value of that future $200 payment, 178.57. I'm gonna do the same thing for my next calculation, the one for $400 at the end of year two. So my N is two, 12% interest. I'm going to arrow down to future value and put that in as 400. So how much should I pay today to receive $400 at the end of year two? Alpha enter, whoops, I went to the wrong one. There we go, alpha enter. $318.88. Do the same thing for the next calculation. At the end of year three, so my N is three. My future value is 600. What is that $600 worth today at time zero? Present value, alpha enter, 427.07. 
And finally, let's calculate the present value of that last payment. N would be 4, I is 12, arrow down to your future value, 800, arrow back up to present value, and alpha, enter, 508.41. So that's the individual present value of each of those future amounts. If we add them together, even though it says negative, we know our calculator gives us a negative because of the way the calculator is designed. So it's really not negative cash. We add them together. When we add them together, that gives us the total amount we should be willing to invest at time zero, $1,432.93, to receive those four separate payments over the next four years. Notice we didn't add 200, 400, 600, and 800. No, we wouldn't pay that amount at time zero to get that in the future because there would be no interest component. So how much are we willing to spend today? 1432.93. Then if you add up the 200 and the 400, that's 600, and another 600 is 1200. 800, 2,000. So you're going to receive a total of 2,000 over the next four years. You only paid $1,433 for that right. So the difference of $567 was the interest because of compounding. And there you could see it again. That's a really nice timeline picture of the calculations we just did. So we can use this in a spreadsheet. Um, let's click on this and see. Hopefully it'll still share. If not, I'll share out for you. I'm gonna stop sharing here and just make sure uh, my Excel. Okay, so you should see the Excel spreadsheet now. So it says consider the following um, cash flows presented in the table below, what is the present value of them? So if your rate is 15%, your cash flow at the end of year one is 1,000, at the end of year two is 3,000, at the end of year three is 5,000, end of year four is 7,000, and end of year five is 9,000. What we're asking basically here is how much should you pay at time zero to receive those cash flows over the next five years, assuming a 15% interest rate. So the formula within Excel is equals minus, remember you've got to treat Excel the same way you do your calculator, present value, B3, which is always the interest rate of 15%. So that's why it's a constant there. Ta um, a B3 is your interest rate. That's just what they want to know first in the formula. And I, I'll go right to this um, answer. You could see it up here in um, your information window. I forget what they call it. Oh shoot, I wrecked it. I wrecked it, I wrecked it. Let's see. Give me a second to escape out of there. Okay, so B3 is your interest rate cell. A6 is what was it's expected to be put next, which is your future value. Then we leave the next one blank for payment. That's zero, or, or there it is right there, zero, comma, B6, which is your future amount. So it's just the way the formula is set up in Excel. They first wanna know the interest rate. They wanna know the periods. They wanna know a payment, a PMT, which is zero. And then they wanna know the future value. And that's just the order we put them in to calculate present value in Excel. So you could do this in your calculator as well, or you could use the formulas 
but this is the Excel formula just to give you a taste of it. And it would automatically calculate each present value. Then you just sum up the present values of C6 to C10. And that's what the last formula represents down there. And it just gives you some comments. The negative sign before the present value makes the result positive. The dollar signs around the B3 make the rate an absolute reference. So if you copy, see if you enter each one of these in separately, you don't really need to put the dollar signs here. What they're saying is if you put this formula and then you copy it down, okay? Normally these things update here. <laughs> they aren't for whatever reason. It's saying keep B3 constant. Just update to A7 to B7, A8 to B8. If you didn't do this, it would go B4, B5, B6, and there's, that's not what you wanna use. You wanna use the 15%. So that's what they're referring to. The formula asks for a payment between number of periods and future value hence zero. So we know when we're calculating present and future value, that PMT area is always zero. And that's that zero in the formula here. Okay, so we just wanted to review that. So if you're playing around in Excel, try it. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint now. Okay. Now, in the next form, um, next example, you are considering an investment that will pay you $1,000 in one year, $2,000 in two years, and $3,000 in three years. Again, if you want to earn 10% on your money, how much would you be willing to pay? So now we're going to determine how much is that $1,000 first payment at the end of year one worth today? So it's that $1,000 would only be compounding for one year. Enter the information in our calculator or our formulas. Its present value is 90909. That second payment, which would occur at the end of year two, we wanna know what it's worth at time zero. So N is two everything else, the $2,000 would be your future value and 10% would be your interest rate. And you can see the present value calculated should be 1652.89, whether you're using your finance calculator, Excel, or the formulas. At the final payment occurs at the end of year three, so it would be compounding for three periods, so our N is three, 10% interest rate, future value is 3,000. So if we calculate the present value for each of those separately, add them up, they are worth $4,815.93 today. So lots of examples here. Now, these are what we call uneven cash flows because they don't they aren't the same amount every year. So another way to use the financial calculator for these uneven cash flows is to use what we call the cash flow keys. Now, I'm looking at mine here. And I don't have them on mine. Okay, but if you have a calculator you, um, that does have cash flow keys, I'm just looking at mine quickly, and I can't say I investigated it thoroughly because I didn't, but I'm not seeing anything even in my finance area to have a cash, let me see. Yeah, CF, let's see. No, I don't have that ability. So on my TI-83, as far as I'm aware, I don't have the ability to do this operation, but you may have it 
on your calculator. So you can follow these steps. Press CF and enter cash flows beginning with year zero. You have to press the enter key for each cash flow and use the down arrow key to move to the next cash flow. The F is the number of times a given cash flow occurs in consecutive periods. Use the net present value key, NPV key, to compute the present value by entering the interest rate for I, pressing the down arrow, and then computing the answer. And then you could clear the cash flow worksheet by pressing CF and then second clear. So like I said, um, unless something pops out at me here on Mayan, I can't give you a huge amount of guidance on it at this point. But if that changes, I will let you know. But if you have this ability on your calculator, you can try it. Otherwise, you just do it the way we've been doing it. So here's another example. Let's put this to work. Your broker calls you and tells you that he has this great investment opportunity. If you invest $100 today, you will receive $40 in one year and 75 in two years. You require a 15% return on investments of this risk, should you take the investments. Now they're using the cash flow keys on a calculator to do this, but you don't have to. You can use your regular finance app. And that's time value of money solver and calculate them separately. So you could do it where you say N is one, I is 15, future value is one, um, okay, $40. And arrow back up and compute the present value of that 40, which would be $34 and 78 cents. Okay. Now, if you have the cash flows, do that. Do what they have there on the slide in front of us. I'm doing this for the benefit of those people like me <laughs> who don't um, at the end of year two. So N would be two, you're going to receive 75. So I want to find the present value of that 75. Whoops, my interest rate is 15. Future value is 75. So present value alpha enter would be 5671. Add those two together. 3473 plus 5681, $91.54. So we're off a little bit. Okay, so would you um, be willing to do this? No because they're asking you to pay $100 when you really should only be paying about $91.50. You are offered the opportunity to put some money away for retirement. You will receive five annual payments of $25,000 each beginning in 40 years. How much would you be willing to invest today if you desire an interest rate of 12%. So you're going to receive $25,000 a year beginning in 40 years. So N is 40, N is 41, Five annual payments, N is 42, N is 43, and N is 44. One, two, three, four, five, there we go. And the first one starts in 40 years. So we could use the cash flow keys on our calculator as indicated there, okay? Or we can calculate what the present value of those 25 payments or those $25,000 payments would be N is 40, I is 12%, future value is 25,000. I'm gonna arrow back up and present value that. And I get $268.67. I'm going to change just my N to 41 
and then I'm going to calculate for present value and I get 239.88. Change my n to 42. Present value of that, alpha enter, 214, 18. Change my n to 43, because remember it's starting in your 40. So this would be the end of your 40, the end of 41, the end of 42, the end of 43, the end of 44. Um, and I'm a present value of that one, and that would be 191. 23. So that's what I would have to invest $191.23 in order to receive that $25,000 payment. And then I'm going to do my final year four, 44, and it's 44, I mean, and then present value of that. Hopefully I did this right. And I'm getting 170 74. So now I'm going to add those. Maybe a little bit longer, but it's doable this way if you don't have those cash flow keys. 268.67 plus 239.88 plus 214.18 plus 191.23 plus 170.74. $1,084.71. The cash flow keys just make it quicker and easier. But it's doable without them. And that's what I wanted to show you. You're just calculating the present value of each of those payments separately and remembering they start in 40 years. So your first end is 40, then your second would be 41, 42, 43, and 44. Okay, so this is just a beautiful timeline of it. So there, see the 40 through 44. Okay, so I'm just going to, we did lots of practice here. I'm going to move on to our next area, which is an annuity. Now, in this first part of our chapter, we looked at payments of uneven amounts for the most part. What if the payments are even? Same amount, same amount of time in between. So equal payments at regular intervals, and they're finite, meaning they have a beginning and an end, 10 payments, 25 payments, whatever it is. Now, what's very important when we're calculating information regarding to these payments is we need to know when the payments occur, at the beginning of the period or at the end of the period. And since we've been dealing in years, what we mean by this is our first payment would begin at the very beginning of year one. So at time zero, that type of um, payment um, annuity is called an annuity due because the payments occur at the beginning of each period. If the payments occur at the end of each period, so how we know this is it begins at the end of the first year, end of the second year, end of the third year, then we call it an ordinary annuity. And it's important to know that because of interest calculations. Now, a perpetuity has an infinite series of equal payments. They go on and on and on and on forever. So let's first, a perpetuity present value is determined by taking um, the cash divided by the return or the interest, the R. Now these begin on page 157. An annuity, we can calculate the present value of those equal payments, same amount of payment over equal time period, what they're worth today. And that's really what the lottery does. So when you see the lottery up on a billboard that says, you know, $20 million, that just means over a time period of say 20 years, you will receive a total of $20 million. But what if you want the lump sum? You want all 20 million today. Well, they have to pull out the interest and that's the payout today. That's the present value. The formula is given there if you like to use formulas, one, 
So it's the, the payment that would be received, the C, the cash payment that would be received each period. You multiply that by this, this calculation, one minus one over one plus the interest rate to the, the number of periods. Then divide that result by the interest rate. That is then multiplied by the payment, the, the cash, each period. That will give you what those payments are worth today. What if you want to know if I put uh, the same amount of money away at the end of each year for 10 years, what will it accumulate to given an interest rate? Well, now you're going to take those annual payments, the C, and multiply them by this result. One plus the interest rate to the number of periods, power, that result minus one, and then divide that by your interest rate, R. Or you could use your financial calculator. But those are the formulas that are utilized to get to present value of an annuity and future value of an annuity. Now, you can use also the PMT um, on your calculator to do these types of calculations, and I'll show you that. Okay. Ordinary annuity versus annuity due. This is very important in our calculators because we want to know when the payment occurs. So when um, we start utilizing the calculator in a few minutes, we'll make sure we bring this to your attention. Here's an example. After carefully going over your budget, you have determined you can afford to pay $632 per month towards a new sports car. You call up your local bank and find out that the going rate is 1% per month for 48 months. How much can you borrow? So to determine how much you can borrow, we need to calculate. What's the present value? So how much can you borrow today in order to be able to pay off $632 a month, assuming there's a 1% interest rate per month and there's 48 months or payments. So using your formulas, you would take 632 times one minus one over one plus one percent to the 48th power divided by one percent, 0 0.01. I'm going to use my finance calculator. In my finance time value of money solver, my N is 48 because there's 48 payments of the same amount. My interest rate will be one. I want to calculate my present value. So I'm just going to arrow over it. Now we're going to utilize the PMT variable in our financial calculator. The PMT is the constant amount we're paying each month, which would be 632. And you can put that in as positive. If you have any money, any dollar amounts in your future value, make sure you replace that with the zero because we're not doing anything with future value here. The other important thing is if you have on your calculator PMT and begin. This is where it's essential that you properly identify if the payment is being made at the end or the beginning. And with loan payments, we're going to say, make this assumption of it's the end. So you're not making a payment the day you borrow the money, you'll make the payment at the end of the first month. So you wanna use your arrow keys and make sure your cursor is flashing over the word end and hit enter. 
so that that is now selected. If not, you're not going to calculate the proper amount. Now use your arrow keys to go back up to the PV. Make sure your cursor is flashing there and alpha enter. And I'm getting $24,000. $23,999.54. That's actually what I got, but I just rounded it. Now look at how we could use our formula there for those of us that are using it. The first thing you wanna do is calculate 1.01 to the 48th power. That gives you 1.61222 Now divide that into one. One divided by 1.61222 That gives you 0 0.62026. Now that 1.01 remember is one plus the interest rate, 0.01, to the payments, 48th power. Now take the number one minus the 0 0.62026040049 we just calculated, and we get 0.37973959951. Now divide that result by 0 0.01. I got 37.973. 95951. Now multiply that by 632 and you get 23,999.54. So that's the steps you should take to solve that formula. Know that whether you use the formula or use your finance functions in your calculator, you will get the same result. And you need to know what you're solving for. We're solving for how much can I borrow today to make $632 in payments each month over the next 48 months, assuming a 1% interest rate per month. Now remember something, what does that translate to in a year? That's a 12% interest rate. Because 1% per month times 12, 12%. So this is how we could utilize present value and future value to borrow money. Suppose you win the Publishers Clearinghouse $10 million sweepstakes. The money is paid in equal annual end of year installments over 30, of 333,333.33 over 30 years. So if you take 333.33 times 30, you get $10 million. That's what they're actually paying you. If they use a discount rate of 5%, so if the current interest rate is 5%, and you said, no, I want the money all today, how much would you actually be receiving today? So now what you're determining is the present value of 30 equal payments of 333, 333.33 <laughs> over 30 periods. So you can use your formula or you can go into your apps on your calculator finance time value of money solver. Now your N is 30, your interest rate is five because these are annual payments. You're going to arrow down to your payment and you're gonna put 333, 333.33. Make sure the word end is highlighted because they come right out and tell us they're end of year installments. You're going to arrow back up to your PV, make sure your cursor is there, and alpha enter. 5,124,150.29. Now, some people will say, well, why would I do that? Why wouldn't I just take the, you know, 300, um, I'll get 10 million. Well, some people will say, I can get a better return, a higher interest rate on my money at, uh, than 5%. And if I can do that over the next 30 years, I'll take the money today and accumulate even more than $10 million. So just say, you know you can get a 7% interest rate. You invest 5,124,150,29 today. How much will it accumulate to in 30 years? And is 30. Now my I is 7% because I could invest my money 
to make 7%. I'm going to leave my present value at a negative 5,124,150. I'm going to make sure my PMT variable is at zero, and then I'm going to solve for future value. Wow. 39 million, six dollars, 339 cents. Look how much more money you could accumulate if I did that right, right? Five million, 124, yeah, 150. That's what it would accumulate to if it earned 7% compounded annually over the next 30 years. So you see why people would wanna take a lump sum. buying a house. You're ready to buy a house and you have $20,000 for a down payment and closing costs, which if you're not familiar, these are just extra costs that are usually associated um, with buying a home. Maybe you have to pay for uh, special insurance on the title. Maybe you have to pay for filing of the title. Uh, maybe you have to pay the bank some extra fees. So they wrap them up all together and they call it, they say, there's 4% of the loan will be paid in these closing costs. You have an annual salary of 36,000 and the bank is willing to allow your monthly mortgage payment to be equal to 28% of your monthly income. So let's calculate that right now. So 36,000 times 0.28. So your mortgage can be up to $10,080 per month. The current interest rate is 6% annually, which is if you take 6% divided by 12, that's a 0.5%, not even 5%, not even 1%, 0.5% per month for a 30 year fixed rate loan. Because mortgages aren't, you don't make a once a year payment, you make monthly payments. How much money will the bank loan you? How much can you offer for the house? Okay, so let's see. You are allowed, so if we go in here, we want to know the present value because we want to know how much can we borrow today. The number of payments, you got to be careful here, aren't 30. 30 times 12 because you're going to make monthly payments for 30 years or 360 your interest rate will be 0.5 in your calculator. Now we wanna solve for present value. Our PMT is 28% of our monthly income, which is 10,080, because that's the most they'll let our mortgage payment be. Future value should be zero. Loan payments always begin at the end of the period. That's the norm. So let's arrow back up and present value that. And I get 1,681,259 dollars, I better do the cents, and 47 cents. So that's how much they're willing to loan, okay? You have $20,000 to put down for a down payment and closing costs. Closing costs are estimated to be 4% of the loan value. So let's see how much that would be. If we borrow 1,681,259.47, closing costs are $67,250.47. We have 20,000 to cover it. What'd I do wrong? Oh, sorry about that. Let me go back. Annual salary. Okay, I'm way off here. Let's try this again. <laughs> I should have went right to the answer, right? I, I locked in, probably you're sitting there going, lady, your monthly income is not 36,000. Monthly income would be 36,000 divided by 12 or $3,000. I apologize for that. Now take 28% of that. $840 is the most that the bank 
will allow you to pay as a mortgage. So again, now we got to change our present value computation. How much would the bank be willing to loan you if your monthly income is only 3000 which is more realistic and it's still 360 because you're still going to have 360 payments on your loan the interest rate is still at 0 0.5 but now the payment went from 10080 down to 840 we're going to go back up to the present value and solve for it the most the bank will loan you is 140104 or 105 because they round it. Now let's calculate the total cost. 140, 105 times 4% closing costs. So you will have to pay 5604 in closing costs. You have $20,000 to cover the closing, closing costs. So 20,000 minus 5604 leaves you with $14,396 you can put in addition to the loan um, to buy the house. So what this is saying is you are able to buy a house that you could borrow 140,105 plus the down payment of 14,396, the part of the 20,000 that you don't have to pay closing costs on. So the most you can buy a house for 154,501. I apologize for that confusion there. I hope I didn't make it too crazy. Okay, but see how one little variable could throw you off. So be careful of that. You see how I just totally missed it. But this you could use in your everyday life. You see that? You can also do annuity calculations on your spreadsheets. Okay, so I encourage you to go out and look at that. I'm going to keep moving. Okay. Let's take a look. Finding the payment. Suppose you want to borrow $20,000 for a new car. You can borrow at 8% per month, compounded monthly, which means you're making monthly payments. So really, your interest rate per month is 8% divided by 12. If you take a four-year loan, what is your monthly payment? So now, you know your present value, the total amount of your loan. You know your interest rate. You know how long or how many payments you can make, but you want to know, well, how much will my payments be? You could go into your finance calculator. So N would be 48. I would be 0.66667. Present value, you could put in as 20,000. And you want to solve for PMT. So make sure your cursor is over PMT. Now be careful. Loan payments always, usually, almost all the time, happen at the end of each period. So make sure the word end is highlighted. Then solve for your PMT, $488.26 per month. So you can use this to calculate how much your loan payment would be. That's all these calculations, a lot of them are. So you can um, actually use the PMT formula in Excel to do this calculation. So you would use the equal PMT, parentheses, you would put your interest rate in, 0.6667. Your number of payments would be 48, NPR, ER, um, comma, present value would be 20,000 and comma future value zero and parenthesis. And that will calculate your payment for you within Excel. So just different options there. And I encourage you to practice them. 
you ran a little short on your spring break vacation. So you put $1,000 on your credit card. You can afford only the minimum payment of $20 per month. The interest rate on the credit card is 1.5% per month. How long will it take you to pay off the $1,000? Another practical use of these time value of money calculations. So now you need to determine the N. You know the I. The I is 1.5. So I'm in my time value of money calculator on my finance calculator. My present value is 1,000 because that's how much I borrowed on the credit card. My PMT is 20 because that's all I can pay each month. I usually make the payments at the end of each month. I'm gonna use my arrow keys to go back up to the end and solve for N. And I'm getting 37.59. Now remember, whoops, I didn't do something right. Oh, okay. That's why it didn't come out right. 1.5, okay. I needed to put, it, it jazzed up a little bit. I forgot about this too. You wanna to put in your minus 20 as your payment. If not, it'll jazz up your number of payments. And now I get the correct answer of 93.111. Now remember, that's not years, that's months. Divide that by 12, 7.75 years. That's how long it'll take you to pay off that spring break if you do this. And if this is the only, if and this is only if you don't charge anything more on the card. So you see how that minimum payment really hurts you. You need to pay more than the minimum payment, even more than the interest being charged on the credit card each month in order to get ahead. Suppose you borrow $2,000 at 5% and you are going to make annual payments of 734.42. Remember, sign convention matters. How long before you pay off the loan? So we have 5% as our interest. Present value is 2,000. So either put that in as a negative or put your payment in as a negative. 734.42, I'm putting in as a negative. I'm gonna go back up to my N, alpha solve, three years. Remember that's annual payment, so that's why three years. One more. Suppose you borrow $10,000 from your parents to buy a car. You agree to pay $207.58 per month for 60 months. How much interest are they actually charging you? So now we're gonna solve for interest. So our N is 60, five years or six, and that would be 60 months. We're gonna leave our interest just where it's at. So use your arrow keys to scroll down. Present value would be the loan amount of 10,000. Payment, put in it as your negative number of 207.58. Remember, you're using that little negative sign in parentheses in your number pad area of your calculator. Make sure the PMT word highlighted is end and um, arrow back up to the interest rate. So your cursor's flashing there, alpha, enter, and you get 0.75%. But that's a monthly interest rate. So multiply that by 12, and the annual interest rate is 9%. A lot of times, if you don't have a calculator, you have to do some trial and error in order to determine um, the rate. So that's why we make the financial calculators or the ability to use Excel um, mandatory for the course. It's a required part of the course because we don't want you trying to figure out formulas more than knowing when and how we use things. So that's why if you don't have one of these calculators with these finance functions, download an app or use Excel. These are just some more examples. I wanna keep moving along. So we looked at present value. What's something worth today? 
what are those payments that we win at the publisher's clearinghouse worth today? Or how much would I have to pay if I borrowed so much today? Or how long would I have to pay or what interest rate? So we looked at the present value for annuities. Now we're gonna look at future values for annuities. So suppose you begin saving for your retirement by depositing $2,000 per year in an IRA. If your interest rate is 7.5%, how much would you have accumulated in 40 years? Now you could determine the future value of $2,000 each time separately <laughs> for 40 years and then add them all up, but you don't have to. We have great quick formulas and calculations. So you could use that formula from the very beginning when we first started talking, or you could use your finance calculator time value of money solver. Your N is 40. Your I is 7.5. Your PV is zero because it has nothing to do with present value. The PMT will be 2000. Make sure your PMT um, word is end because we want to make sure the payments are happening at the end of each year. Um, future value then would be solved for. So arrow your cursor up to the future value, alpha, enter, and you get $454,513.04. Now, the next area we're going to look at, so that's just one, a future value. But those were all ordinary annuities. Remember, these are annuities where those payments, excuse me one second. Well done, Clance. My doggy needs to go outside. Um, those were where the pay, the equal payment, the same amount is happening at the end of each period. Now we're going to take a quick look at, oh, excuse me, how much or what happens, how do we calculate if the annuity payment is at the beginning, the beginning of each payment period? So here's an example. You are saving for a new house and you put $10,000 per year in an account paying 8%. The first payment is made at the beginning of year one, today, time zero. Okay, you're going to put money away at the beginning of year one, the beginning of year two, and the beginning of year three. How much will you have at the end of three years? So your first payment is today, $10,000 per year. So beginning of year one, beginning of year two, beginning of year three. Now you're calculating for an annuity due. Because you made a payment the beginning of the year in that first year, you have a whole extra year's worth of interest that's accumulating that you wouldn't have had if you made that payment at the end of the first year. So N, is going to be three, whoops. So I'm gonna make sure in my finance calculator, my N is three, my interest rate is eight. I'm not sol um, solving, okay, nope, I'm solving for future value here. So present value is zero. PMT will be $10,000. Here's the key. I'm gonna go down to where I have my PMT and the words end and begin. I'm going to make sure I arrow over to begin and make sure that's the word that's highlighted now because that's when the payments are occurring, the beginning of each year. Then I'm going to arrow back up so my cursor is highlighted near future value because that's what I want to calculate for, alpha, enter. And you should get 35,061.12. Now let's say you forgot to change the PMT from end to beginning. And you can go ahead and do this. Go and change it to end and then solve for future value. Look at the difference. It would look like you're only saving $32,464 when in fact, because of when you made that payment, the beginning of the first year, you accumulate almost $20,000, $3,500 more in interest. So that's why it's very important, we're vigilant about making sure the correct word is highlighted when we're calculating amounts for annuities. And there you can see, 
time one, at time zero, you're accumulating interest for first year, second year, and all of the third year. The first payment or the second payment, two years, and then that third payment is accumulating interest a whole extra year. Suppose the Fellini company wants to sell preferred stock at $100 per share. A similar issue of preferred stock already outstanding has a price of $40 per share and offers a dividend of $1 every quarter. What dividend will Fellini have to offer if the preferred stock is going to sell? Now, if you're like, what does this have to do with anything? Well, now we're changing gears. Now we're looking at perpetuity calculations. So what this is saying is, uh, now I'm on page 165. What if you have the opportunity to buy an investment that will pay an amount for ever, or it doesn't have an end date? And that's what we have here. A um, this company wants to sell stock at $100 per share. There's a company that has similar stock that sells for $40 a share that has a dividend of a dollar. So what would Fellini have to offer if the preferred stock is going to sell? Well, we use our perpetuity formula, and that says, what is, um, we'll take the present value, so what's the stock selling for, divided by the dividend, the cash payout, over the required return. So the information about the dividend we do have and the stock is that there's a similar stock that's currently selling, its present value is $40 a share. It pays out a dollar. So what is the actual return to that similar stock? Well, $40. Let me, uh, if we take one divided by 40 and flip our, do some algebra there. One, the number one divided by the $40 a share, that's the dollar is how much is actually being paid if you pay $40. So your return is 2.5% per quarter because the dividends are paid each quarter. So how much would the stock have to pay if they want to sell stock for $100? Well, 100 would be the present value. Dividend amount we're trying to figure out, we want to use the same return as similar stock, 2.5 per quarter. So if we take 100 and do our algebra times 0 0.025, the stock should pay $2.50 per quarter. If it doesn't, people won't invest in it. So this is um, one example of where a perpetuity calculation would be um, used to calculate. I'm kind of reading here and, and going as we go um, to calculate dividends. Just going over this. Now, Table 6.2 is a great table to refer to for your different formulas and what things mean when it comes to calculating annuities, um, future value of them, present value, 
and present value of perpetuities, like we just saw. Wow, check that out. <laughs> now that's a formula. The next area talks about what if we have a growing annuity or a growing perpetuity? And that formula, <laughs> ooh, wow, is used to calculate the present value where we have a growing stream of cash flows with a fixed maturity. Page 167. Annuities commonly have payments that grow over time. Suppose, for example, that we, were, we are working at a lottery payout, or looking at a lottery payout, I'm sorry, over a 20-year period. The first payment, one year from now, will be 200000 Every year thereafter, the payment will grow by 5%. So it doesn't stay constant, but it constantly grows at the same percentage. When we have that type of an annuity where the payment constantly grows at a certain percentage, we could use a formula to help calculate that annuity's present value. And we could do this for our perpetuity present value if the growth rate remains the same over time. So there it is, our present value equals our payment divided by our interest rate minus our growth times one minus, first do the stuff inside the parentheses, one plus the growth divided by one plus the rate. Raise that to the number of, pay, of periods, power. Subtract that result from one and then multiply it by your payment divided by your interest rate minus growth. That's how that formula works. So let's see it in action. A defined benefit retirement plan. Remember that's defined benefit means the person basically knows how much they're going to receive in retirement and for how long. And here's what they find out. It offers to pay $20,000 per year for 40 years and it will increase that annual payment 3% each year for those 40 years. What is the present value right now of that future retirement if the discount rate is 10%? So in other words, it's saying, how much would you have to pay today in order to have the ability to receive that $20,000 for 40 years if those payments increase, that 20,000 will increase 3% each year. So take your payment, 20,000, divided by interest rate minus growth rate. So 0.1 minus 0.03 gives us 0.07. I'll divide that right now and get my result. And I'm getting 20, I'm gonna write this down quick, 285, 285714. Now, divide 1.03, 1 plus the growth rate, by 1 plus the interest rate, 1.1, 1 .1. Raise that result to the 40th power, a little character talk 40, and you get 0 0.072. Subtract that from 1. and you get 0 0.927925, okay? Multiply that result by the 285,714 we just computed, and we get 265,121.31. So make sure you know how to fit that information into the formula and complete the calculation. So this is a doable problem as long as that growth rate remains constant. It's always going to be 3%. We could do the same thing if we know uh, a payment that's gonna go on forever will continue to grow at the same rate, like our dividend. So the present value would be the payment, like the dividend, over 
the interest rate minus the growth. Take a look. Your expected dividend next year is $1.30. And dividends are expected to grow at 5% forever. If the current interest rate, discount rate is 10%, how much should you pay for the stock today? So take $1.30, that, that next year's dividend, and divide it by the interest rate minus the growth rate of 5%, which would be 5%. $26, that's what that is worth today. So you can invest $26 to get $1.30 each year forever. If there's a growth rate of 5% in that dividend each year. Wow, that's a lot of stuff going on there, right guys? We're almost nearing the end. Oh, we still have a little bit more to go here. Yeah, a little bit, not much. All right. So that's a lot of work, but we saw some great information so far. We saw how to calculate present value and future value even of uneven payments, not the same dollar amount. We saw how to calculate annuities, present value of those, and the different components, whether it be the interest rate or the number of payments or the payment amount itself. We saw it for future values of an annuity. We saw it for annuity dues. Most annuities are ordinary, but what if the payment begins at the beginning of the period? Then you have an annuity due situation. And we saw it for perpetuity. Then we also saw it if our annuity or a perpetuity continues to grow at the same rate each year, the payment grows each year at the same rate. So we're giving you a toolbox here. These are all formulas that can be used to calculate various items in finance. And that's all we're doing is collecting tools so that when we are in this situation, we can go, hey, I have a quick formula or I know an Excel formula that will help me calculate the answer for that. Now, the final area of our chapter deals with interest rates. The actual, in, actual rate paid or received after accounting for compounding that occurs during the year. This is what we call the effective annual rate. If you want to compare two alternative investments with different compounding periods, you will need to compute the effective annual rate and use that for comparison. The annual rate is the one quoted by law. So annual percentage rate is period rate times the number of periods per year. To get the period rate, we rearrange the annual percentage rate divided by the number of periods per year. You should never divide the effective rate by the number of periods per year. It will not give you the period rate. So you are quoted an annual percentage rate when you sign up for a loan, 10%. Divide that by 12 and that will give you your period rate if you pay monthly. So, what is the APR if the monthly rate is 0 0.5? 0 0.5 times 12 months, 6%. We already showed you that. What is the APR if the semi-annual rate is 5%? Well, twice a year. So 0 0.5 times two is 1%. And what is the APR? What is the monthly rate if your annual percentage rate APR is 12%? with monthly compounding. Well, now you divide it by 12. So it would be 1%. So it's the quoted amount divided by the number of, um, or the, the rate you're looking for, whether it be monthly would be 12, you divide it by twice a year semi, would be six. I'm sorry, would be two, would be two times per year. You always need to make sure that the interest rate and the time period match. 
So if you are looking at annual periods, you need an annual rate. If you are looking at monthly periods, you need a monthly rate. And that's what we were talking about before. If you are looking at how much should my loan payment be each month, well, then you make sure your N is in terms of months, not an annual amount. So if you have an APR based on monthly compounding, you have to use monthly periods or adjust the interest rate appropriately. And that's what we were doing this whole time. They're just reminding you here. What about the effective annual rate? Well, suppose you can earn 1% per month on $1 invested today. What is the APR? Well, one times 12 is 12%. But how much are you really earning? Because it is compounding and earning interest on the interest. Well, it's a future value. You can invest $1 today and earn 1% per month compounded monthly. One plus the interest rate to the number of periods it's compounding, 12. So at the end of year one, that $1 is really $1.12.68, okay? To get the rate, subtract the dollar, 12.68%, okay? So although it says you're earning 12% annually, in the end, you really earned 12.68% percent. Suppose you put it in another account and earn 3% per quarter. What is the annual percentage rate? Well, 3%, four quarters in a year, is a 12% annual interest rate. But how much are you really earning? Well, now, because you're earning interest on your interest, Take one times one plus the interest rate, number of periods it's compounding, four. 1.1255 would be the amount that you earn, subtract one from that, and then divide that by one, 12.55%. So that's your effective annual rate. And the formula for this is on page 169 as well. interest rate. So there is your formula again. One plus the annual percentage rate divided by the number of periods. I'm pretty sure. Yep, and monthly periods um, or whatever periods there are. And it's the number of compounding periods per year. So in this case, we we're talking about monthly, so it would have been 12, but that's what your M represents, and then minus that from one. So that's another way of getting it quickly. So you're looking at two savings accounts. One pays 5.25 with daily compounding, the other pays 5.3 with semi-annually compounding. Which account should you use? Well, how much are you really earning? What's your effective annual interest rate? One plus, um, 0 0.0525 divided by the number of compounding per year, 365, to the 365th power. So you want to complete that first, the computation within the um, parentheses, then raise it to the 365th power, subtract one. 5.39. Do the same thing with your second. One plus 0.053 divided by the number of compounding periods per year, two to the second power, complete that computation, subtract one, 5.37. So you would pick the 5.39% one. And this is just showing you verification of that. If you have an effective rate, how can you compute the APR? Just rearrange the formula. 
So it would be the number of compounding periods times one plus the effective annual rate to the one over the number of compounding periods power minus one. So suppose you want to earn an effective rate of 12% and are looking at an account that compounds on a monthly basis. What do you want the annual percentage rate to be? Well, take 12 times one plus the interest rate um, to the 1 12th power. So one divided by 12 would be 0 0.0833. So one plus 0.12 to the 0 0.083333 power, now subtract one, and then multiply that result by 12. 0.1138, so 11.39%. You want the bank to say, we pay an annual percentage rate of 11.39% monthly, okay, um, effective rate, okay, for you to actually earn an effective interest rate of 12%. Okay, so to wrap up the end of the chapter, let's look at our last area. Suppose you want to buy a new computer system and the store is willing to allow you to make monthly payments. The entire computer system costs 3500 the loan is for two years. The interest rate is 16.9% with monthly compounding. Remember, that's an annual rate. What is your monthly payment? So you're going to use your finance calculator. And N will be 24. Interest rate will be 16.9 divided by 12 or 1.4083333. Present value is 3,500. We want to calculate payments. We're going to make sure the word end is highlighted. We're going to make sure our future value is zero. And then we're going to go up and put our cursor white by PMT alpha enter, we get $172.88. Okay, so we're just using our interest rate, converting it into monthly rates. We've seen some of this already, been practicing it a lot. Suppose you deposit $50 a month into an account that has an APR of 9% based on monthly compounding. How much will you have in the account in 35 years? Well, first of all, we need to know 35 times 12, that's 420 months. The interest rate is nine monthly, it would compound at 0.75%. Per, um, percent. Going back into our finance calculator, so our N is 420, our interest rate is 0.75. Now we want to know how much will we calculate in the future, so this has nothing to do with present value, you want to make that zero. Your payment is going to be $50 a month. And then we want to alpha enter on future value to get 147.089.22. So now another example of using monthly compounding, but now looking to the future value. You need $15,000 in three years for a new car. You can deposit money into an account that pays an annual percentage rate of 5.5% based on daily compounding. How much would you need to deposit today? How much would you need to deposit today? Well, first of all, our N, daily compounding would be 365 days a year times three years or 1,095. Our interest rate would be 0.015068493, 5.5% divided by 365 days gives us a daily. The amount we want to accumulate to is future value, 15,000. Now we're not making regular payments here. We just want to deposit one amount at time zero with these 
conditions. So let's go back up to present value, alpha enter, we would have to deposit 12,718.56 today. So just showing you different ways you could use APR to do calculations. Sometimes investments or loans are figured based on continuous, constant compounding. To determine the effective annual rate, we take e to the q power minus one. The e is a special function on the calculator that is normally denote, denoted by e to the x power. And I see it on Mayan. Actually, on my LN key on the left-hand side, third button from the bottom. So, what is the effective annual rate of 7% compounded continuously? So, I'm going to do, I'm going to see if I can do this. Let me get out of this. Okay, A second alpha E to the point. O oh, seven power. Okay, so what I did was I have to hit my orange button, which is my second button. It's at the top of the left column and then the LN button because that's how I could get the EX function. When I hit that, then it's going to come up with E, the little hi-hat for the, the power symbol and a parenthesis. Then I entered 0 0.07 and then entered and I got 1.0725. That result, you then subtract the number one and you get 7.25%. So that is when you have constant compounding. You use that formula to determine your effective annual rate, how much you're actually making. Wow, a lot of different types of calculations, including loans. Um, please, any kind of questions you may have, post them to the discussion board. I think I hit just about everything in the chapter, but if there's anything confusing you, just let me know.